Hi everyone! I'm going to show you a lesson on membraning fur hides, which means to remove the membrane layer from fur hides. This is a crucial, crucially important step. This is something that I'm doing on all fur hides. I consider it essential in my process of tanning fur hides well. Um, sometimes I also call this dry membraning or dry buffing. That's, I'm just talking about the same thing. Okay, so this applies to all small fur hides I'm tanning, like, like coyote down, you know, to chipmunk and rat all the way down. So uh, I am always drying fur hides before tanning them. Always. I'm always drying fur hides, okay? Um, yes, it's possible to tan fur hides without drying them first. Of course it's possible, um, but I just find that for a number of really important reasons, hides tan better for me if I dry them first. Um, and that's not unique to me in my process. That is, uh, I do hear that from other tanners as well who have similar experiences. Um, so I'm going to turn the camera around and show you the hide I'm working on today. And just another note is that uh, I'm doing this dry membraning step on furs whether I plan to tan the hide vegetable tan style or brain tan style. Okay, so it doesn't matter. This, I'm doing the same step even if I haven't decided which way I want to tan the fur. I'm still doing this step right here. Okay, so here's a fur hide that is already salted and dried. Uh, this is a red fox, and this particular hide is one from my process videos recently. If you uh, are one of my patrons on Patreon, then you saw a video of me um, fleshing this hide, and we had some good lessons on fleshing and stuff like that. So this is a hide that... Um, I don't know, I skinned a couple of weeks ago maybe, and already fleshed, so this hide has been step one, skinned, step two, fleshed, and I fleshed this hide on my fleshing beam with my metal scraping tool, my metal fleshing tool, to remove all the flesh very thoroughly. Then this hide was salted and dried. By salted, I just mean a thin layer, like an eighth of an inch of sodium chloride, table salt, sea salt, whatever you got smeared all over the flesh side of the hide, all the way out to the very, very edges. Salting, just to be clear, is not an essential step in tanning, period. It actually, salt does not tan hides, nor does it really aid in the tanning of hides. That's a myth. Um, I'm sure there's folks who will argue with me about it, but um, overall, salt is a convenience. It's a modern convenience. Uh, Overall, in my life, eventually I'd like to get away from using it as much as possible or altogether. But it's convenient, especially here in the southeast, where the climate is very moist. It's humid. It can be very rainy uh, in certain seasons. So it is very difficult to dry fur hides, dry hides in general, in this part of the country, southeast and mid-Atlantic. Um, as opposed to like, you know, the southwest or other drier climates of the world. So, uh, I use salt as a convenience because if you salt your hide, the hair is not going to fall out. It's not going to rot. Like, it's pretty much just insurance that like you can roll that thing up and put it in a plastic bag if you want to. It can stay, the skin can stay moist and wet for weeks dry with salt on it and it is completely preserved. What salt does is to both inhibit and arrest bacterial activity in the skin. It prevents rot. It's a preservative. It's one of the world's greatest preservatives. So that's it. That's all salt does. So it, it just means that, you know, if I skinned this animal and fleshed it and I didn't have a perfect clear sunny day to hang up the hide or t stretch it and tack it to dry it in the sun, you know, because it was like evening already, so there wasn't any sun, and it was kind of a cloudy day, and, you know, I, I knew I was not going to be able to dry the hide well, and I'm tired, and I needed to make food, you know, real life, right, where I'm just like, oh, I don't have time to deal with this anymore, 
salt it, roll it up, put it in a cardboard box, and that is where it has stayed for two weeks. Or you can salt it and just hang it up, like on a clothesline. It really doesn't matter whether you roll it up or hang it up or lay it flat somewhere. It really doesn't make a difference. Um, so what does make a difference is that here in the southeast, uh, I'm in Maryland right now, but I experienced this all throughout the entire southeast and mid-Atlantic. The climate is very sim fairly similar where it's fairly moist. So only in this humid climate do I feel that I can get away with dry salting hides without stretching and tacking them first. Okay, what that means is that, you know, salt salt pulls water out of skin so like if you salt meat or salt hides and then hang them up you know on a clothesline for the first day the hide or your meat is going to drip water because the salt is helping to pull water out of the hide salt also does the reverse so if a hide is really dry but the air is really humid and damp the salt will pull moisture back from the air into your hide. So that's why, you know, this hide, which now is fairly dry, it kind of has that crinkly texture to it. If I put this down in the dank, dark dungeon basement here, um, where there's a lot, of, a lot of moisture, after a day, this hide will be sopping wet again because the salt will have pulled moisture back in there. So what that means is that here in the southeast, often, not always, but often, hides, especially small hides, um, once they're salted, always remain kind of malleable. Like, they don't ever tend to dry super hard and stiff, like hard plastic, because there tends to always be some moisture content in the skin due to the salt pulling moisture from the humid air back into the skin. So what that means is that I can scrape or buff a dry salted hide here in the southeast without having to stretch out my hide, tack it like on a crate or a wood board or something so that the hide dries all stretched out and flat. Okay, so if I tried to do this probably in the southwest, I bet, like just you know, rub some salt on it, hang it up. It would dry very stiff and hard and with all these crinkles in it, right? Because the hide was just free form. So all these crinkles would be very hard crinkles and I wouldn't be able to smooth them back out by pushing on them. So that's just to say that if you're in a much drier climate, you know, like Colorado, then you may find that you need to stretch and tack your hides before drying them so that they stay in a nice open flat shape. Here in the southeast you don't have to worry about it. So it's one of it's one of the nice benefits of this climate. But this climate has benefits and drawbacks for tanning, to be sure. So this hide, so I call that dry salting. When I rub salt on a hide and then I let the hide dry. I call that dry salting. If I were rubbing hide rubbing salt on the hide and then wrapping it up and sort of keeping it in a bin or something where it could not dry because I wanted it to stay moist, like with deer hides, I'm always doing that. I usually call that wet salting. Okay, so wet salting versus dry salting. So this hide has been dry salted and I did not stretch and tack it because I don't need to because I'm here in the southeast. So um, I did just unravel this hide today and, you know, it had been sitting for a couple weeks in a cardboard box, and it was still a little bit damp in the skin, so I just laid it out in the sun for a couple hours while I did some other stuff, and now it's pretty much, pretty much dried. Um, so this is what it looks like. You know, so you can see that I can, like, push down the bumps and wrinkles. It's, like, it's fairly movable. It kind of has this tacky texture to it. So that's very typical of dry salted hides in a humid climate. So I'm going to dry membrane this hide. Like many of my videos, I'm doing this on a wood board, just any flat surface. I like flat wood surface without like knots that are bumpy. You know, you just need like a nice <clears throat> flat smooth surface. Putting my hide on top of it and 
uh, I use a stone. Okay, so this is a stone that I would call medium grit. Okay, so it's not a super smooth river stone, but it's also not a stone that has really jagged, sharp edges that would cut into or tear the skin if I were to rub my stone on it. So, you know, it's kind of got smooth, blunt edges here and a medium grit. Now, rocks like this, I find, are the best tools for me for dry membraning hides. It's what I use 100% of the time. And these aren't special rocks, I just find rocks wherever I go, like look in the streams or anywhere. And sometimes I'll just, you know, walk through the stream and pick up half a dozen rocks that kind of look good to me, that have sort of a medium grit and smooth edges. And, you know, then I'll just kind of try a few out. And I just might find that I like one better than another, one works better than the other. So you gotta just, um, just try some. But I know no better tool for doing this than just a wonderful rock straight from the ground or a stream. Okay. So, even though I flushed this hide, when a hide is fresh, we call it green, you know, when the hide is still moist, fresh off the animal, and you use a scraping tool to remove all the flesh, the skin looks very clean underneath that flesh. However, most likely there is still a completely intact layer of membrane all over this flesh side of the hide, and you just can't really see it. Uh, on a fresh hide after you have fleshed it. And you really can't scrape it off either. The membrane doesn't really start to separate from the rest of the skin until the hide starts to dry. Um, it could be, it starts to separate when the hide is like partially dried and tacky and also when it's fully dried. So that is one of the great benefits for me of drying fur hides before tanning them. For one, yes, mysteriously, it does seem to help the fur affix to the hide. It almost like helps the hair follicles affix to the hide. Um, and I just tend to find a less, less chance of hair slippage while tanning if the hide is dried first. But also, a dried hide really enables you to thoroughly remove all the membrane very well you can take your time doing it because the hide is dried. It's dried, it's preserved, there is no rush. You can work on this a little bit every day for weeks if you wanted to. You could do it all at once. It doesn't matter, but there's no rush. Okay, so you can be very thorough about it, which is wonderful. So, um, what I'm going to do is... I can't show you me doing it the whole time because I need both my hands. So what I do is use one hand to really hold down a section of the hide because I don't want the hide to be bunching as I'm scraping it and I also don't want the hide to be rubbing against the wood board so much. You always, always want to avoid with fur hides the fur side rubbing too much against whatever surface, against whatever work surface you have, because you want to avoid any and all agitation as much as possible to the fur side and to the delicate epidermis layer underneath the fur, because with too much agitation, that epidermis can start to kind of lift up off the hide, peel off, and it'll take hair with it. So if you don't know what these layers are, membrane, epidermis, etc., watch my Tanning 101 classroom video and I talk about all of those layers of the skin in depth. So I'm going to just start anywhere, it doesn't matter where, just come up with a method so that you cover every single section of the skin. Like you could do a, a grid, like go this way, across the hide, across, 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 and then down, it doesn't matter. Just come up with a method so that you, you know that you got to every section of the hide. And, right, so with one hand I'm gonna kinda hold the hide flat and taut. And with my other hand, holding the stone, I'm going to buff it kind of gently at first to get to know my stone. So I'll do a section that I don't really have to hold with two hands, just to show you. So I'll find a part of my stone that I like and, and I'm just 
gonna start scraping. Again, ideally I would be using both my hands for this to make sure the hide isn't moving around too much. And here, I was just scraping right here. You're not going to see too much of a difference, the hide before and after. It's not going to be very obvious. All that's happened is just these little peelies. It's just like teeny weeny bits of membrane just kind of broke apart and roughed up a little bit. Or maybe there really wasn't much membrane left on there to begin with. So some areas like that, it's not going to be a dramatic difference. In other areas, uh, there will be quite a dramatic difference, but it doesn't matter. You still want to get your stone over every single section of the hide, whether it looks like a lot is happening or not. I'm going to do a section where you'll be able to tell something's happening. So over here, I'm gently buffing, and right here is where I was just buffing in an upwards direction, and you can see that it's lifting up these little peely sections, and you can kind of grab hold of them sometimes, and they come off just like that. So this little piece of paper, that's membrane. Okay, so it's like a thin papery layer of the skin. And that's sometimes going to peel off in chunks and you can grab a hold of it and it can be very satisfying. Sometimes you can pull off real big hunks. Um, but if it's, you know, it's not always just going to pull off really satisfyingly. So, you know, your stone you just keep going, your stone will keep lifting up more of that. Right here. So it's going to be breaking it up and lifting it up. And see how that's coming off? On a fox, there's going to be just one single layer of this papery membrane. Um, and that's the case with most animals. You don't need to go over and over and over the same section. Once membrane is clear of that section, you're good. Domestic rabbits are the only exception to that rule. So with foxes, they're, they're pretty easy to membrane. So I'm going to do a whole section and show you what that looks like uh, and come back. So here's a nice little close-up here on this edge where I was buffing with my stone where you can really see sometimes just how thin and delicate the membrane layer is. Like, just see this little stuff lifting up. Very thin. Very, very thin. That's membrane. You see it here. Lifting up. Okay, so that's what we're getting off. I'm going to keep going. Okay, so I have finished membraning a small section. Uh, so the line is from about here to here to here. All of this. So kind of all of this out and here. And as you can see, the hide is not going to look a heck of a lot different before and after. So this is a step that is difficult to describe and show in video and in writing. Um, which there are a lot of things in tanning that are that way. Um, you really learn it by feel and doing it in person. So here, not membraned. This right here. Here, membraned. <laughs> And so one thing is it will feel differently afterwards, like the skin already feels softer. Um, but, and here's, you know, here's what your board will look like. Like here's all the little kind of debris that you should expect to see all over the place when you're finished membraning a hide. Some of that is little bits of salt broken up, but most of it is this just soft shredded membrane, which is a skin layer, which is quite soft. Okay. So honestly, when I'm teaching tanning classes in person, you know, a student will be like buffing a hide and ask me, oh, you know, is this section done enough? And I'll be like, oh, I don't know, let me see. And so what I have to do usually is take the stone myself, take their stone, and I scrape that same section they just did. And I'm honestly just seeing, are any more peelies coming up? Like that's how, that's how I'm getting a feel for it. So in one way, 
if you just kind of keep scraping the same section and like the hide isn't changing anymore like no more peelies are coming up nothing else seems to be happening then I'm like oh okay nope you did a great job like that area is done being membraned so it's 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 tactile it's in action like you'll just see like okay I buffed this section and this all this peely stuff came off and now I continue to lightly buff it and nothing else is really coming off so that's kind of your indication that you're done and um, in general um, if you're t planning to brain tan a hide, doing a very, 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 very thorough membraning is very important. It really makes a huge difference in how your hide will turn out at the end, in, in softness, and you being able to soften the hide to a nice garment quality, quality softness without crunchy areas. If you're planning to vegetable tan a hide, um, you don't have to be quite as thorough. It's good to be thorough either way, but with the vegetable tanning method, there is a bit more forgiveness in the process for removing membrane because there's an extra membraning step later to get off any remnants. So, good to be thorough no matter what, um, but if you're planning to, planning to brain tan, definitely be extra thorough. It's, it's worth your while. It's definitely worth it. So I'm going to keep working on most of this hide. I'll see if I get there or not today. Um, you know, I don't know. On a whole hide like this, like, I don't know. Maybe this takes me half an hour. Maybe sometimes it takes me an hour. It just depends if I do it all at once or not. It's not something I usually time. Um, but, you know, there's no harm in taking your time with it because the hide is, is preserved. So, especially when you're getting a feel for it. You know, it's, it's best to just, um, don't rush, definitely don't rush, and go light, like I said, go lighter at first, and uh, you can rub harder as you are discovering that um, you're not tearing into the skin. And in general, you know, thick areas of the hide, like the neck, the spine here, and the neck tend to be very tough, so you can usually scratch much harder on those areas of the hide. Whereas thin belly skin along these edges, you want to be much gentler because these these edges, which are thinnest on all hides, are the most apt to rip and tear and, and you don't want to be too rough. Um, <laughs> front legs, like especially on foxes, front legs, these just tend to be a pain in the butt. It's very difficult to get the membrane off of the front leg area here and when you're softening a fox, these front leg areas tend to always be some of the crunchier areas so but all other areas of the hide you should be able to get off the membrane very thoroughly now this fox doesn't have the face on it which is rare for me because fox faces are so beautiful and I always skin them out but this one was roadkill and had a huge hole and just was not going to be a good face so if your face is on there you want to do the stone all over the face as well. You just want to be very careful, you know, not to run over the eyelids, um, stuff like that. So you just kind of, face work is always just slow and delicate and bit by bit. You just, <laughs> just keep working on it nice and slow and thorough. There's really no huge secret to it that way. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think I'll do some more and show you what it looks like afterwards. Bye-bye! So here's the whole fox after I just membraned, did a membraning pass over the whole thing. I don't know, maybe it took me 45 minutes or something like that. And as you can see, overall it does not look dramatically different than when I started. And yet, for me, this is like a fairly, fairly good, fairly acceptable membraning. So up here by the neck, uh, neck and upper legs, here and here, this whole region of the hide was probably, had the most dramatic peelies, you know, where like I was really peeling off tons of, tons of thick peelies throughout a lot of this area. Um, you know, and then I'll, a lot of the main body of the hide here, you know, like wasn't dramatic peelies coming off. It was more just kind of like, 
dead skin, like the feeling of when you scratch your own skin and just like dead skin comes off, very subtle, all the way down here. So, you know, wasn't a whole lot coming off visually, but still rough up every little section of it. Um, and you can see, you know, like I said, after you've done dry membraning a hide, like this is just what the whole area around you should look like. It should just be littered and all these little papery membrane scraps, all this kind of stuff, you know, should just be everywhere. <laughs> uh, if you leave it, if it gets rained on, it just sticks to whatever surface it's on and just starts to rot over time. So if you don't want that to happen, sweep it up while it's dry. So let's do, do a little bit more close up so you can see. This is the surface of the skin I'm going for. You know, it's kind of, it's gotten softer. In certain areas it gets whiter, but not always. You know, it looks more roughed up. It's more textured. Um, the center of the spine area doesn't really look dramatically different that's all good you know because what this is doing is it's removing membrane breaking up membrane and also just roughing up the surface of the core fiber layer underneath the membrane and that's really nice too just to have the core fibers roughed up just a little bit white spots like that are just from the salt it's not a big deal it goes away don't worry about it um, but even Oh, and like when I say soft, I just mean like texture-wise. Like this hide is still going to be crunchy as heck. Okay. Um, and do just give a little bit of scraping inside the tail. Don't forget that. Usually almost nothing will come off from the tail. But I do just like to do this little like scrape, 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 scrape. You know, and then move on down. Scrape, scrape, scrape. So, yeah, don't expect anything to happen in the tail. And... Tails can be very delicate, so I just kind of do a delicate little buff in there, just to just to touch, like I said, just touch my stone to every part of the skin. And that's it. So this hide is probably good to go. Like yes, there's probably still little bits of membrane here and there. Perfection is impossible for me, in my opinion, but. You know, I just try to be thorough. Um, yeah, some areas, especially like this leg, like is very dry. Like it wouldn't really flatten out as easily as other sections. So you'll be able to notice that areas that are more crinkly and dry and that don't flatten out as easily are harder to buff and harder to get the membrane off. So you you get a little taste of what it would be like if your whole hide, if you were in Colorado and your whole hide dried crinkly like that with very tough crinkles you can see that with a stone there's just no way you could really buff a hide because you just can't yeah you just can't get the hide to flatten out so it's it's a no-go or if you like live in a climate control building or house you know where the humidity is much lower than the natural outside air humidity and you dry your hides indoors, that will happen to you also. Like your hides will just dry crinkly and super hard, right? So I recommend if you, that's where you live, like keep your hide in a garage or a shed or a barn, I don't know, something where it's um, as close to the outside, humid air, moisture content as possible. Um, yeah, this hide is also unusual. This, I mean, this car hit animal just seemed like it really went through it because it has all these um, wound damage holes in the neck um, so it's kind of an unusual hide for me um, I'm gonna see how it goes I still don't know at this point whether it's gonna be a vegetable tan or a brain tan hide but the hair is really thick and nice it was a nice winter coat so it is really really wonderful so you know, even without a face and, you know, where these busted holes are here. You know, I may end up just... 
I don't know. You know, I may end up like cutting the hide off from here or just tanning little little patches of the good parts here to use in other projects. So it's kind of going to be like a scrap hide, you know, not like one whole complete perfect face on full hide. Um, but as I've said numerous times, imperfect hides are a godsend, <laughs> right? Because when you go to make a garment and you have like three foxes and they all have perfect faces that you've worked so hard to tan and perfect tails, you know, you're like, oh shit, well now to make a coat or whatever, like, I've got to cut these up, you know, like, I can't have 16 faces on my, you know, outfit. It's just kind of ridiculous. So it's a real blessing when you have hides that, you know, are imperfect to begin with. And you're more willing to, like, <laughs> use them in projects. So I welcome that for sure. Um, so that's my little lesson today on dry membraning furs. Wonderful step. Very important step. Very simple. Um, but yes, a big deal and does take a bit of effort for me. It's definitely like a major step, you know, that I may be dedicating an hour to and, you know, I'm scraping very hard in a lot of this, in a lot of these areas. So I'm really working hard in other areas. I'm just kind of, eh, you know, buffing over, uh, in a quick way. So it just depends. Um, foxes, coons, possums will all kind of go like this. Um. Uh, squirrels can be a little bit tougher, but, you know, gray squirrels, I do the same way, just like this. Hey, if their hair on. Um, yeah, like I said, domestic rabbits are the only ones that are kind of in a different category. That's why often I teach classes that are, like, just on vegetable tanning domestic rabbit furs, because they're so different than other furs. And one reason is that they have multiple layers of very thick membrane, which all told add up to almost a greater thickness than the core fibers of the skin, which is just nuts. They're very different skins. So there we go. What I'm going to do now is just store this until I'm ready to continue at some point so I can just roll it up dry. I'll just keep it in the house in like a paper bag or cardboard box or whatever. I don't want to keep it forever in case bugs get to it, like hide moths will love this if they find it. They love dried fur hides and they'll make their cocoons all in the fur and start eating holes in the skin and the hair will fall out. So, you know, I don't expect to be able to keep a dried fur like this indefinitely. I like to tan it as quickly as possible. Um, but for me, my next step with this, because it's salted, I need to get the salt out. Also because this particular fox was unusually greasy. <laughs> Kind of like all the foxes I've processed this season from here in the Baltimore area. Often foxes are lean as a green bean. And sometimes foxes are fatty as heck. It's unbelievable. Like greasy. So there is a lot of grease and fat in this hide. So my next step would be when I'm ready to soak this in water, room temperature, or slightly warm to rehydrate it. And I would probably wash it pretty well with soap, get out any oils that I can. And then I will have to, um, if I plan to brain tan it, stretch it and tack it so that it dries flat. Uh, and re-dry it in the sun so that it's nice and flat for me um, whenever I'm ready to smear my egg or brains on it. If I'm going to vegetable tan it, you know, I rehydrate this in water, wash it with soap. And then it's ready, wet like that. It's ready to just go into tannin solution. So, you know, from here on out, the two paths diverge. <laughs> the two different routes of vegetable tanning or brain tanning. Um, but up to this point, sorry, up to this point, the steps are the same. So that's all for today. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye-bye. Hi everyone! I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. That's my that's my aim in putting out these videos. Uh, this is just a little hauler that um, if you are kind of liking this style of video, this format, if you're learning, if you're benefiting, benefiting from it, um, and you would like more videos like this, um, I'm inviting you to head on over to my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash storms of daylight. Um, and 
you can simply support this work if you enjoy it for a couple bucks a month and that's a huge help and it means so much um, and if you would like more videos every month um, you can join a higher tier and get additional videos each month um, on a lot of topics but one of those is tanning process videos where I'm just kind of showing you steps of the hides that I'm working on in my life in real time and kind of giving you tips and lessons along the way. Um, so not like a step one, step two, step three class format, but like a here's how this hide is going in real life. <laughs> and here's some of my advice and tips. Um, so thanks for watching. Bye bye. Spread the word.